Hi everyone, my name is Brennan Batoy. I'm a fourth year medical student at UBC and I'm graduating in the year 2021. Today's lecture is on Dupuytren's disease. Today's discussion, we're going to start with an introduction. We're going to discuss the epidemiology, the pathology, the relevant anatomy. Uh, we will discuss the clinical presentation and then the different treatment options that are available. Dupuytren's disease is a benign fibroproliferative disorder of the palmar and digital fascia. It is a progressive disease that afflicts primarily the hands with the development of pathologic tissue that originates from existing normal palmar fascial structures. This results in the formation of nodules and cords that will ultimately develop into characteristic contractures seen in the photo here. The proposed mode of inheritance is thought to be autosomal dominant with variable penetrance and expression. The highest incidence occurs in Caucasian males of Northern European ancestry. It typically affects males to females at a 2 to 1 ratio. Incidence increases with age, with the most common ages being between the 5th to 7th decade of life. It most commonly affects the ulnar rays, with the ring finger being most commonly affected, then the small finger and long finger. The thumb and index finger are less commonly involved. It's important to note of an aggressive presentation of the disease, known as Dupuytren's diastasis. Typical features include male sex, early onset, bilateral involvement, family history, and presence of ectopic disease. Garrod's pads, which can be seen on the picture on the left here, is an example. Other ectopic disease presentations include penile fibromatosis, also known as Peyronie's disease, and plantar fibromatosis, also known as Lederhaus disease. What causes Dupuytren's? The major contractile element is the myofibroblast. Myofibroblasts generate significant contractile forces and transmit this force to surrounding collagen matrices. The second thing involved is the conversion of type 1 to type 3 collagen. For example, normal fascia contains approximately 5% type 3 collagen, whereas in Dupuytren's disease it contains approximately 40%. Dupuytren's is a progressive disease. It can be thought of in three stages. Stage 1, the early phase, consists of skin changes including the formation of skin pits and nodule formation. Stage 2, the intermediate phase, consists of the development of cords. In stage 3, the late phase results in joint and tissue contractures. Understanding of the anatomy is critical to understanding Dupuytren's disease. The list provided here is not an exhaustive list. Uh, we have highlighted the key anatomy involved. So beginning with the central aponeuroses, the apex is located at the proximal aspect and coalesces with the palmaris longus. It's a triangular fascial layer and extends distally and it's oriented in three dimensions, longitudinally, transversely, and vertically. The longitudinal fibers form pretendinous bands that continue distally as spiral and central bands. There are two groups of transverse fibers, the transverse ligament of the palmar aponeuroses and the natatory ligament. These spiral bands are a distinct con uh, continuation of the pretendinous bands and represent the connection between the palmar and digital fascial components of the complex. The three components of the digital fascia are Cleland's ligaments, Grayson's ligaments, and the lateral digital sheet. Of note, there are two components of the palmar fascial complex not involved in Dupuytren's, and it's a common question you may be asked. Those are the transverse fibers of the palmar aponeuroses and Cleland's ligaments. Discussing the contractures, the first one is the pretendinous band, uh, which turns in the pretendinous cord, and it causes MCP contracture. Next is the natatory cord, uh, natatory ligament, which turns into natatory cord. It's a cause of web space contracture. Grayson's ligament, the lateral digital sheet, the pretendinous band, and the spiral band all contribute to form the spinal, spiral cord, which causes MCP and PIP joint contracture. The spiral cord can displace the neurovascular bundle proximal, midline, and volar. The central cord, an extension of the pretendinous cord, is responsible for PIP joint contracture. Finally, the lateral cord causes PIP or DIP flexion contracture. DIP hyperextension can be caused by the retrovascular and lateral cord, which are not seen here. Dupuytren's disease is a clinical diagnosis, therefore a thorough history and physical examination must be performed. 
First, understand what is the patient's chief concern and the reason they've decided to come in now. Identify the progression of their disease thus far. Ask questions regarding the patient's functional limitations both at home and at work. Things such as combing hair, putting their hands in their pockets or gloves, driving or playing sports can all be affected. Obtain a family fit history, and finally a thorough general history as stupid trends has been associated with conditions such as diabetes, epilepsy, and is related to alcohol consumption and smoking. On physical examination early in the disease, you may notice palmar skin thickening or pitting. Early dupitrins can be often mistaken for trigger finger or stenosing tenosynovitis. Patients may also present with painless nodules or cords in the palm, as well as the development of progressive flexion contractor. Ectopic disease may be located distant to the palmar fascia. Patients with bilateral disease may commonly present with Gerard's nodes. It's important to note that Dupuytren's is a progressive disease with no cure at this time. Recurrence is common regardless of treatment, and setting expectations is key with Dupuytren's patients. The role of non-operative management has evolved over the years. Initially, observation is key as a form of non-operative treatment because isolated nodules without contractors do not always develop into cords, and cord contracture may be non-progressive. As the disease progressive, intralesional steroid injection of Dupuytren's nodules can be done. This has been associated with softening or flattening of the nodules. Collagenase injections and needle fasciotomies may also be performed. Collagenase is derived from Clostridium histolyticum. It's injected into diseased cords and works by lysing contracted collagen cords. After the injection, a second appointment several days later is made where external manipulation extends the injected cord, resulting in its rupture. This less invasive tr technique can be done in the office without the use of general anesthesia. Complications in the short term include edema, pain, and skin tear from cord rupture. In percutaneous needle fasciotomy, a needle is typically used to percutaneously section the contracted cord at multiple levels, followed by early active and passive range of motion exercises. Here on the far left, you can see a windshield wiper method. Alternatively, you can gently stab the cord until you weaken it. Once that's done, you can hyperextend the MCP and PIP joint to obtain a complete rupture of the cord. Be aware that skin tears are common with this procedure. So when do we operate on Dupuytren's? Surgical indications include an MP joint contractor greater than 30 degrees. Textbooks may state that any degree of PAP joint contractor is an indication. However, this isn't a hard and fast indication. Many clinicians will go by 15 plus degrees. What's more important for surgical indications is loss of function and rate of progression. Severe adduction contracture, especially within the worst web space, if there is a compression neuropathy associated with the pre presentation is another indication. Finally, a positive Houston tabletop test is another indication. You can see in this image here, the patient is asked to put their hand flat on the table. If they cannot lay their hand flat on the table, the test is positive. Surgical treatment involves the excision of the diseased fascia. Numerous surgical treatments exist, including a radical fasciectomy, which includes removal of all diseased and healthy fascia. A dermatofasciectomy involves removal of all diseased fascia and skin with a full thickness skin graft laid on afterwards. Both of these procedures are not often performed. A limited fasciectomy is the most commonly used technique. It involves a longitudinal dissection of diseased tissue. Typically, only diseased tissue is removed. Great care must be taken to identify and protect the neurovascular bundle, as we had discussed on previous slides. In this image here, you can see approximately a 60-degree contractor at the PIP. Intraoperative photographs ideal the neurovascular bundle proximally as indicated by the arrow and the clamp is on the proximal aspect of the cord. Intraoperatively you can see that the cord has been removed and the flexor tendon is shown. The flexor pulley system is not disrupted and the neurovascular bundles are preserved. Immediate post-op photographs show less than 5 degree of, fle of flexion contracture. Other complications other than digital nerve and artery injuries and involved the hematoma, flap necrosis, and Dupuytren's flare response. In summary, Dupuytren's is a fibroproliferative disorder of the palmar fascia. In order to understand Dupuytren's, understanding of the anatomy is absolutely critical. 
Remember that Cleland's ligament and the transverse ligament of the palmar aponeurosis are not involved, and the neurovascular bundle is displayed proximal, volar, and midline. Dupuytren's is a progressive disease with no cure at this time, and recurrent rates are high. Although there are non-operative and operative management options that do exist. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation.